it wasn't like we were going to sit there, think about it for too long, like instantly. As soon as we said we were going to do this, we got right to work and didn't really, you know, look back. And I think that that helped. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. This episode of Side Hustle Pro is brought to you by Comcast Rise. Comcast Rise is a multi-year commitment to provide marketing, creative, media, and technology services to qualifying small businesses owned by underrepresented groups, beginning with a focus on Black-owned businesses. I've checked out all of the levels of support Comcast Rise offers, and it is incredible, you guys. When I'm looking for opportunities, I personally seek out programs that are going to provide guidance from someone more experienced or that offer resources I need for my business. And that's exactly what Comcast Rise offers. Selected businesses could receive one or more of the following business services— advertising and marketing consultations, or production of a 30-second TV commercial, plus a media strategy consultation and 90-day media placement schedule, or the chance to get a complete technology makeover of computer equipment and internet voice and cybersecurity services for 12 whole months. And there's opportunity for monetary grants as well. So definitely, definitely check this program out, you guys, to apply today for marketing, media, and tech makeovers at no cost to help you and your business rise. Visit sidehustlepro.co slash Comcast Rise. One more time, that is sidehustlepro.co slash Comcast Rise. Hey, hey, guys. Welcome, welcome back to the show. It is Nikayla here and... Today in the guest chair, we have Vera Moore. Vera is the co-founder of lingerie brand Love Vera. She's also currently side hustling. An accountant by trade, Vera has worked with leading global financial institutions throughout her career. One of her earlier forays into side hustling was launching a women's swimwear line in college, which afforded her a glimpse into the industry of fashion and e-commerce. She later pivoted to starting lingerie line, Love Vera. In this episode, I love what Vera had to share about the origins of the company, how she learned, grew, scaled the company, and how she went about sourcing products and how they have pivoted to designing custom items for Love Vera now. She shares so much, so many gems. Get your pen and paper ready, y'all. Let's get right into it. Welcome to the guest chair, Vera. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm well, thanks for being here. So I always want to give a little bit of background, right? I want to know in your own words, who's Vera and when did you start side hustling? I wear many hats. I'm a mother, a daughter and a sister first. I'm very close to my family. I'm also a booty. I love traveling and I've always had a a love for fashion and entrepreneurship. Um, In my role as the co-founder of Love Vera, I serve as the brand voice. I direct the aspect of the brand. Um, select the styles that we bring to market, and I'm the liaison between our models and creative talent. So a transition into entrepreneurship was a natural next step for me, as I've always had an interest in creating something of my own. I didn't know what it would look like, but I knew that I wanted to take ownership of my future. Um, so in terms of like side hustling previously, um, I guess I started a swim boutique, like an online boutique with my sister when I was in college. Um, and that went really well, but I obviously, you know, had to focus on my studies. So that kind of faded away. And then I also, I had a tax business and I like kind of built my tax clientele through social media. Um, another, you know, experience that was really interesting and fun. I learned a lot. Um, Very but interesting. I, I think I knew about the swimwear, but not the tax hustle. So <laughs> many hats indeed. Yeah. And it didn't, you know, neither of those things, things really stuck for me. Um, and Love Vera was kind of that thing that stuck. That so. stuck. Yeah. Now, I've read about your background in accounting. Why accounting? <laughs> was it the money? Was it, were you really have an interest in numbers? Um, I think it was a combination of things. I definitely was, you know, interested in making money. But I think that once I, when I graduated my degree in accounting, I said, okay, um, I, basically I gave myself a five-year goal and I said, I'll work in this field for five years. And then after that, I'll kind of pursue my own interests. And I thought that, you know, having a background in accounting was a good foundation 
for any business that I started. So yeah, I kind of like, you know, studied accounting with the goal in mind that I would eventually start some other type of business. Okay. And that, yeah, accounting is definitely such a good skill to have. So kudos to you for thinking and and having that foresight to know that. Now, I love, what I love about you, I think many of us can relate to knowing that, hey, we'd love to explore doing our own thing one day, but not necessarily knowing what that is. Um, The great thing about you and, and the fact that you embrace side hustling is you are okay dabbling as we all should be, before you figure out what that is, because the dabble gets you closer to what it actually is. So let's let's talk a little bit more about that swimwear brand with your sister. How did that come about? How did you guys start actually making the swimwear? And how did it go? What were the sales like? Um, so basically, <laughs> we were very young and inexperienced, and we just wanted to try something. I think that we were more in it for the creativity and the fun versus the money. Um, and so we kind of, you know, sat down and we created our website together. We figured out how we we're going to source the products and everything like that. Um, I actually went to school in Maryland, and my sisters went to school in Philadelphia. And we did this, you know, like as a side hustle during the summer. So eventually, once you know, school was back in, it was kind of difficult to first of all, juggle our studies and then also kind of work together, but not actually physically be together. So um, that makes sense. Yeah. And our sales were decent. Like, it, like you, I mean, it was just a fun, like cool little college side hustle that made us a little extra money. Um, yeah, it was, it was really fun. I think I actually learned a lot from it also to kind of apply to Love Vera now. So that was great also. So why did you decide to pivot to lingerie? Having done the swimwear, I knew that that was something that was pretty successful. I think that we saw that there was like a huge opportunity in in the space of lingerie specifically. Because when you think about it, especially like when we were about to launch, there wasn't a Savage Fenty or anything. There was basically the only lingerie name that I knew, obviously, was Victoria's Secret. And I didn't feel like Black women were represented very well with Victoria's Secret. I didn't feel like plus size women were represented. And so, like I said, I just felt like there was a great opportunity in that space. So obviously, like when I went into Love Vera, like I said, I learned a lot from the swimmer brand. And so I continued doing what I'd always done with my other hustles, but I just put a lot more purpose and intent into it. And I think that that's what made it work. What year was that? That was, so I graduated in 2015. So that had to have been like 2013. And then what were your first steps to get started? I'm really curious of how you go from being a college student with an idea to then actually getting samples of your lingerie made. Now, you know, that just seems like that just blows my mind a little bit. Um, I have lots of ideas and actually going out there and doing it. I'm first of all, so impressed, but yeah. What were your first steps? Those early days were definitely really fun and exciting. You know, there's obviously so much to learn and figure out. We did take a sourcing trip to China, which was very exciting. That was my first time um, going over there. There was like a huge fair that they have every year. So I got to see like a number of different products and things. It was just a really interesting experience. Obviously not everyone is going to be able from the beginning to be able to take such a you know huge trip. But there's a lot of other steps that we took as well. So I think the first step was finding a unique product to sell. So on top of like traveling and taking that trip, we also ordered samples from a lot of different places, Asia, Europe, different parts of the U.S. Um, Once we found the product that we liked, we we had to create a brand identity and voice. Um, I definitely think that our trajectory and place in the market would be very different if we didn't create our brand identity early on. We also had to figure out how we were going to fulfill our orders and where we were going to store our inventory. To be completely honest with you, we were storing our inventory in my parents' basement for a good you know, a few months in the beginning. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> and then I was I was fulfilling the orders myself. Um, I would get off of work, you know, and I, I had a long commute. So I would get home and, you know, have dinner with my family and then start working around nine o'clock, 10 o'clock and be up till one o'clock in the morning, fulfilling the orders myself. Eventually, once the orders started to pick up, we did shift to 3PL, which is, has been amazing for us too, because, you know, we instantly kind of saw growth once we could take the focus off of like packaging because it just mm. it so much time and, you know, focus on some of those more important growth areas. Uh, what else did we have to do? I think it's important to note that there's like a huge difference between what you think is, how you think is going to be running the business and how it actually is, you know, in real life. So okay, um, a lot to do and a lot to learn, but it was really fun and interesting. 
first, I want to know more about the sourcing trip there. <laughs> Like what, how did you find out about this? Was this a fair just for lingerie brands? Like what is a sourcing trip? So it's like, it's called the Kenton Fair and they actually sell so many different things. When you go, it's, it's a humongous, like it's huge. They have um, everything you can imagine, shoes, luggage, they have medical supplies, like anything and everything that you could imagine that you would sell, they have at this fair. Okay. And we went for, we literally went, it was so crazy because I had to work. So we went to China for like two days and came right back. What? Uh, yeah, it was really crazy. We had to have a translator um, come to the different booths and everything with us. Cause and who, and who is we at this point? Is this you and your sister or? No, this is me and my partner. Okay. Nate. Yes. So my sister, no, my sister doesn't work on um, La Vere with us. This is just me and my partner. So, Got it. um, Yeah. And he had actually gone, that's just kind of how we even got started on the idea of building a brand together. He'd actually gone on a sourcing trip previously, like the year before. And when he went, I was like, oh, well, um, while you're there, check out the different things that they're selling. Um, you know, I think I'd be interested in, in starting something. So that's kind of how the whole idea started in the first place when he went on his initial trip. And we were like, okay. Um, and he checked out some different things. I mentioned swimwear and then he was like, oh, well, I think lingerie would be, you know, even better. So nice. It's good to have a partner who, you know, is on the same track. In addition, I love that you mentioned that you quickly got on to creating a brand identity. I think that is so important. And tell us a little bit more about what do you mean by a brand identity and what is the brand identity of La Vera? I guess it's important to say what we represent and what we stand for. So Love Here is a celebration of Black women, culture, and, and entrepreneurship. And we've built our following um, due to our dedication to self-love, inclusivity, and body positivity. Um, and basically, like I said, our mission is to create opportunities for Black talent and fashion. And so like when you check out the website, when you check out the social media, everything, you kind of instantly realize that there's a great deal of representation, especially for Black women. And I think that um, that made a huge difference for us because I think that people or especially black women and, you know, our customers felt seen and appreciated and heard. And that was the feedback that we got from the very beginning. And that's kind of how we knew that this idea was going to work for us. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that it really stood out to me. And like you said, this this came to be before a lot of the brands now that are heralding body inclusivity had even dropped, right? So you guys were pioneers in in this sense. And it's just awesome, the the different shapes and bodies that you use. And hell, I, it makes me, I'm like, oh, that's how I will look in it. Because everybody knows that feeling of looking at something and being like, but will that work for my body? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. What are the rules of my body, you know, and having to have that talk with yourself, like, mm -mm 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 -mm, don't believe that model. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the feedback that yeah. we get all the time, honestly. All the time, people are like, oh my God, I, I definitely see myself. I yep. know what I'm going to look like when I'm. So, how did you go from that sourcing trip to starting to sell product, though? Um, you know, where, did you start out with a few items and then scale up some more? Tell us about that process. So, yeah, we started with a few items. I think, you know, it was very important to us to not do too much too soon. We needed to figure out um, basically what our customers liked, what worked, um, figured out the sizing. So we didn't buy like a huge amount of inventory or anything like, anything like that. It was kind of like a test. You know what I'm saying? Like in terms of what's going to work for us? What do you think? What do we think our customers will like? Um, so we had like a nice variety of different styles and things like that. But it wasn't like too specific or anything like that. It was pretty broad, like I said, just to kind of figure out what was what was going to work for Lavira. What did you realize through that process? Like what worked for your customers? What surprised you? And how did that inform how you move forward? For me, I think that lingerie is such a specific product, um, especially it's, it's very individualized. So, you know, what I like or what works for me is not going to work for everyone else. So I think that we learned mostly to keep that variety um, in terms of style, in terms of color, um, even, you know, sizing and things like that. Um, when we initially launched, we actually didn't have plus size. So we did get, you know, instantly the feedback that we needed to expand our sizing. And that's what we did. That was a huge part of the business as well. But like I said, kind of coming in, you know, we had to, you know, manage our inventory and things like that. So we didn't want to do too much too soon. There's that delicate balance, though, between starting small and then expanding to like all this variety. 
because you don't want to have too much inventory, right? So how do you navigate that delicate line of making sure you don't have too many SKUs, aka too many um, different items that people aren't buying, and then you get stuck with a lot of inventory? So basically, I guess we went in with the general rule in mind that when you first go into business with this type of venture, you want to create a minimal viable product. And so, like I said, we put in as little expense as possible. Um, We didn't buy a huge amount of inventory and we didn't invest heavily in one area or the other. We also, you know, spent a little less on advertising and things like that. Um, Because, you know, we, even though we knew who we wanted our customers to be, we had to figure out who our customers were, what they like, and, you know, what works in general. And then, like you said, once we figured that out, we were able to double down and invest more heavily in the areas that we knew worked for us. And I think that was a good way to avoid, you know, losing money early on as well. Speaking of that, what did this really require financially? I mean, that you mentioned investment. So what were those initial investments and how did you pace yourself so that your sales could support your investments? Because we were managing the amount of money that we wanted to spend and we kind of had a ballpark of what we thought was reasonable to test our idea, um, we decided to DIY a lot of the things that we needed to do. Um, Basically, we were very incremental in our approach in order to ensure profitability for Love Your early on. We did not have to take investments from anyone else. We kind of just tapped into our savings, just give you a ballpark. It was closer to five figures. And like I said, in terms of like DIYing different areas in order to save money. We used, instead of having a stylist come for the photo shoots and do different things like that, that add up, we would, you know, I would personally do some of the styling for the photo shoots. Um, We invested minimally in the product. um, Basically, like I said earlier on, just to kind of figure out what would work for the brand. And then, like you said, you, once you figure out what works for you, you can scale up your growth. Um, You don't have to go all in and, you know, do anything too crazy in the beginning. And I think that that's what helped us to be able to manage the cost of the business early on. Okay. That, that is helpful because sometimes we have this all or nothing approach. Like we got to go big. We, we're, we always, always comparing ourselves to somebody's our day one to somebody else's, you know, four years. And okay. it's okay to start with like two pieces. Cause if those are the flyest pieces on earth, the people are going to want that. And then you'll be like, okay, so I can, you know, maybe to move up to five ten now. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Now you mentioned having all that inventory at your parents' house and the pain of fulfillment at times. But then you mentioned that you transitioned to something. What was that? 3PL? Can you break that down a little bit more? Um, yeah. So, and so basically we found, well, we've actually worked with a few different warehouses now, but we're okay. now like working with one that actually works for us um, perfectly. It's a smaller family owned business. And basically they, they house all of our inventory in their warehouse and they fulfill the orders. And this really helps. I think, you know, this significantly helped the business as well because we were able to get orders out much quicker. So you'll, um, you know, you'll see a lot of feedback from the customers. A lot of people will say, okay, um, I ordered, my, you know, I ordered something at 9 a.m. and it shipped the same day. And that's for the most part, a lot of our orders go out very, very quickly. And I think that that was great because if you're new to a brand and you're trying to figure out if you want to order or not, and you're not, you're just not sure. And you know that it's a smaller business and it may take a few weeks or whatever for you to even get the product. When you see other people saying, oh yeah, um, I got my love here in three days. You know, that really, really significantly um, helped our business. People oh, were yeah. very excited about the turnaround time. And that's exciting. You know, I know when I placed an order, um, I, first of all, my husband makes fun of my package addiction. I think it's like having (laughs) Christmas every day. Like when you have a package as an adult, it's like, you don't have to wait for Christmas. So when, when I order something and when I order from you guys and I saw that email a few hours later, and then you can track it and you like get updates along the way. I'm like, oh yes, like these are the brands I want. You guys pay attention. These are the brands I love. Uh It makes me want to come back because you're competing with the likes of brands. I'm not going to talk about other names, but who can ship you stuff in two days, right? Who, and you can go on your app and see exactly, you know, what's going on with your package. So other brands who don't necessarily have that technology do what you can to make the customer feel like their money went to a secure place, like their stuff is coming. So thank you guys for that. 
I appreciate that. I'm um, speaking of finding your manufacturer or excuse me, your fulfillment center. Um, was it easier to find your manufacturer after you went to this uh, fair or did you have to go through like a few? Like, did you see, um, you know, designs by one person and then they weren't that great and then you end up switching to another person? Like, and is your designer the same as your manufacturer? Help me out here. What's going on? Um, so, uh, like in the beginning we were selling, um, basically we were doing, uh, wholesaling. So we were selling other products that were not love bear products um, oh. in the manufacturing process, which in design process, which we're extremely excited about because now we're carrying, you know, our own unique love bear designs that you can only get from love bear. Um, and they're amazing. So we don't have to cut back when, you know, when you're going and looking at, um, other brands that you want to sell, you kind of have to like improvise or say, oh, I love this part of the bodysuit, but I don't love that part. But you don't really have a choice because it's already made. Whereas now we are manufacturing our own products and we are manufacturing our designer. They're all in the same, under the same umbrella. So it works really well. They're really amazing. And even though we're a smaller brand, they work with some really huge other brands. They don't treat us like the little guys. They really respect us and they work with us. And this is a very new thing for me and my partner. They're very understanding and patient with us. You know, some of the terminology and different things and the way that things work, we're not you know, fully knowledgeable of. And so they work with us to get through that. And we really appreciate them for that. Hey guys, it's Michaela here with a quick word from our sponsors. You guys, the other day I received a shipment of woven Side Hustle Pro labels with my logo on it and I got emotional. It's one thing to birth an idea. It's another to see your physical brand label in front of you. And the labels are bomb. I have to tell you where I got them from. It's from this cool new crafting store called Dutch Label Shop that produces retail quality woven clothing labels. Their labels are the same kind of durable fabric labels that you see on big brands and stores. They have figured out a way to make the same high quality labels at virtually any quantity and at an affordable price. So whether your side hustle is knitting items, or maybe you're an Etsy or Shopify store owner, the presentation and price point of your items increases exponentially with a professional label. And that is what Dutch Label Shop provides. In addition to woven labels, Dutch Label Shop also offers printed care labels. You know, the ones that tell you how to wash and care for an item. Plus they offer pre-made size labels and custom hang tags. And right now, Side Hustle Pro listeners can get a special discount on every label product that Dutch Label Shop sells. Head over to DutchLabelShop.com and enter the promo code HUSTLEPRO at checkout to take 15% off your order. Starting a business isn't easy, right? So did you face any mental or even physical roadblocks in the process of starting up La Vera? Tell us a little bit about that. How did you deal with your challenges? I would say one of the biggest mental roadblocks for me was just having to put myself out there for the world to see. I think there was a part of me that didn't want to fail in front of others. And also just having to worry about making sure that whatever you're putting out there, you know, properly reflect reflects how you want to represent yourself. And it's up to par with how you like to represent yourself. Um, And I think that, you know, self-doubt is one of those reflexes that we all have that is really meant to like protect us and keep us from doing anything too extreme or too crazy, um, you know, but um, I just basically had to get comfortable in overcoming that um, and moving beyond that. Um, And then also another hurdle, I guess, is kind of like me and my partner, we both have, you know, a little experience here and there with fashion, but, you know, going into business without any like industry know-how and industry connections is definitely challenging. And then in terms of like physical limitations, I would say time and endurance, obviously, We only have so many hours in the day. And like I mentioned before, I'm a mother, girlfriend, you know, daughter. And so prioritizing prioritizing my time has been huge for me. A lot of people, you know, you hear about a lot of entrepreneurs that face burnout. It's like, it's pretty common, I think. But you kind of have to, once again, like overcome that. It requires you to put forth another level of consistency and things like that to kind of push through the tough times. So. You mentioned that you are a mom, you are 
your girlfriend and you have these other parts of you where you want to show up and give your 100% and your full attention, what have you found to be helpful in juggling those aspects with your business, your growing business? I think it's very important to always be intentional about how you manage your time, very intentional about balancing your time. Um, And so for me, it's like sometimes, you know, I'll go to dinner with my partner and we'll sit there and we'll be talking about love Vera. And I'm just like, okay, this is like us time. We have to separate business time and personal time and family time. Um, And like I said, I'm very intentional about that. And I think that that helps my family knows that they're, you know, my first priority. And so, yeah, like I said, just literally penciling in time, like this is what I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do that. These are my working. Well, the working hours are never really consistent. Sometimes I bump till 3 a.m. But um, <laughs> in general, so, yeah. such is life with a, a side hustle, right? Yeah. Um, but I like that you you check yourself. You check your, your, you know, and you're like, okay, we are talking about business right now. And this is us. Mm-hmm. This is, the, you know, like we got to nurture us. So mm-hmm. that's that important, like checks and balances kind of system that you got going on there. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the profitability piece. Um, I think it's exciting when you have a side hustle because you still have that engine of income coming in um, that you you don't have that kind of pressure to make everything be profitable right away. So what has been your experience with it so far? You know, a lot of people lose money in those first few years. And again, that's okay. When you're side hustling, you you give yourself that grace. So what has been your experience with losing versus becoming profitable? In terms of losing, we haven't lost just because we've been, you know, very careful about investing in our product and just in general investing in the business, like minimally, basically without doing, putting on too much risk. Inventory risk is a huge issue for a lot of fashion brands. And so like, you know, on the fixed cost side, you obviously minimize those expenses. And then on the variable cost side, you make sure that your unit economics makes sense and it's cash flow positive. So basically, you know, if you have an an average order size of X amount of dollars, after you take out your cost of goods sold, your advertising expense, shipping and handling, and any other expenses associated with the transaction, you want to make sure that your cash flow positive. And that's another thing that we've been very careful um, and intentional about. And I think that my background in business and accounting has been helpful with that as well. You know, one of the things that I'm really sitting here just in awe of and that I admire the most about what you and Nate are building is you are living the model kind of business as far as how you're pacing yourselves and growing and having a really attractive product to your customers that sells well while also keeping overhead pretty low or, you know, in a good uh, responsible position. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that, that's the word. But there's some things that you can't DIY, right? Like you, you're not out here sewing the lingerie yourself. So how do you keep the aspects of your business that you can't DIY? How do you keep that overhead low? Okay. Like you said, being responsible in the partners that we choose to work with, um, the different platforms that we work on, um, we kind of shop around as much as we can. Um, And obviously, in some areas, you're just going to have to invest more. And I think that we do invest decently in our content and things like that. But I think that it's worth it. I think that it makes a huge difference for our business. Because I think when you have, you know, content that that isn't as great or, you know, the website doesn't look as neat, um, when you cut corners, sometimes it shows. And I think that if you, you know, if you don't look serious, if your business doesn't look serious and other people won't take you seriously either. So I think, you know, even though there's areas where you won't be able to cut corners or save costs, those are still worthwhile investments for sure. I also love that you've made it a part of your mission to hire Black creatives, Black models, uh, models of different sizes, many of whom have experienced rejection and discrimination in their careers. What inspired you to do this? So even once we decided on the idea of launching a lingerie brand, we toyed with a a lot of different approaches that we wanted to take. And, um, you know, at this point, I was already looking at models. We had very diverse models of all different backgrounds and races and things like that. But there was one particular model that I had my eye on and she was going to a modeling call in Miami. And basically she posted about, you know, some of the struggles with, being a Black woman in the fashion industry and how challenging it is to land these roles. She basically told us on the internet, She on her Instagram post, she said that this one young woman, she wears an afro. They basically told her, you know, the casting directors told her that 
the Afro was a no go. You know, they did a lot of different things to her, basically to discriminate against her. And I also saw that a lot of other black models were facing the same challenges and were having a hard time uh, booking jobs and things like that. So once I saw that in that particular post, I was like, you know, I was on the fence, like how I wanted to, like how we wanted to represent ourselves and, you know, what our mission was. Once we saw that, we were like, oh, wow, this really is a huge problem. And I think that, you know, we we should be the ones to kind of address it and make things better for these models. So we actually did hire that particular model um, and she did a great job. She helped us to recruit other models um, and continue to stay in touch with her. So basically, like I said, we saw that there was an issue um, in the fashion industry and that's not just with lingerie, that's everywhere. And obviously not even just in the fashion industry, that's almost every industry where black women have a hard time um, doing what they need to do. So once we saw that, we were just, you know, that was like, that moment where I was like, oh, this is going to be, we have to do this. Like we have to make this like a black brand. We want to hire more black creatives. Um, And I think that that was the best decision that we made, honestly. Yes. I just, I love, you know, your Instagram. I love the, the way you present your, um, your products. It's just so, it's just fun and it's, it's relatable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So kudos. Now, you guys are doing it. You're doing it scared at times. How did you overcome this initial fear of risk? Because let me tell you, I got some more ideas in my head and I am pushing through some fear right now. So tell us, how did you overcome those fears? And how do you continue growing your business every day with those fears? So I feel like for me personally, I felt like a lot of the fears came from what other people were telling me. I do think that people push their own fears onto you. And so even when I, you know, started to tell people that I was launching this lingerie brand, people were kind of like, they didn't say it, but they were kind of looking like, oh, that's, you know, that sounds a little silly. But (laughs) so um, I think, like I said, a big thing for me was overcoming that self-doubt and not really, you know, worrying so much about what other other people thought of my ideas in my business. Um, And also, I think that the reason why we were able to kind of overcome these fears is because once we got the idea, we kind of just went right into it. It wasn't like we were going to sit there and think about it for too long. Like instantly, as soon as we said we were going to do this, we got right to work and didn't really, you know, look back. And I think that that helped. I think when you just go for it, it helps, you know? I'm curious to know how you manage, speaking of self-doubt or what people think about your business, uh, now that you've launched, after you launched, you know, things like Savage Fenty came out, like you mentioned, and other things that people are getting so excited about, um, approaches that you are already doing. So do you view this as like good energy or do you ever get like scared of the competition? How do you keep yourself focused on your lane? Um, I definitely feel like there's enough room for everybody. I look at it as healthy competition and not in a way that I'm, you know, fearful Um, Anytime I look at any of what these other brands are doing, obviously, you should always keep your eye on your competition. But at the same time, you don't want to compare yourself too much because I think that that can be very negative, obviously, um, and to your detriment. Like, so basically, you know, keep your eye on, you know, what you're doing um, and focus on that. I think that that will make you a lot more successful. How will you know when it's time to take this from side hustle to main hustle? Um, So for me personally, I think that, um, you know, my time is coming now. Um, Like basically I spend a lot of time. um, I feel comfortable and not afraid to take the leap now. Um, And I think that, you know, I'm starting to realize like working a full-time accounting role, it's very time consuming sometimes of working 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever it may be, and investing way too much time into someone else's dream, basically, instead of my own. But I think that, you know, even in speaking to other entrepreneurs, once when you know, you know, I know it sounds silly, but I think it's just a feeling. I think that when you have everything together um, and you know that your bills are covered and you know that, you know, you can continue to go and invest in yourself, I think then that's when I'll know that it's time for me as well. I hear you. So now what is next for Love Vera? What do you guys got on tap for 2021? I'm very excited to know. We are extremely excited about all of the products that we have coming to market soon. Um, like I mentioned earlier, all of the designs coming going forward will be Love Vera exclusive um, designs. So, you know, we're fi- constantly finding ways to enhance Love Vera experience. 
Um, so this fall and then coming winter, we have our best line of products ever coming out. Um, it'll be like very high quality production, the best colors, best options and styles. Um, these will all reflect the needs of our consumer. Um, I'm personally most excited for our new collection that is launching soon. Um, so stay on the lookout for that. And we definitely didn't overlook any detail or anything. So we have a lot of surprises coming. I think that um, everyone's going to be very excited to see. Ooh, all right. And before we jump into the lightning round, I just want to know if you had a chance to start La Vera all over again, what would you do differently? Um, so I would say if I had a chance to start all over again, I would have definitely, um, you know, we had a few hiccups in the beginning in terms of the different creatives that we work with and things like that. Um, so I feel like some of the things that we had to deal with, they were not, you could not have avoided, like I said, because we didn't have like any industry connections yet. We didn't really know anyone. So um, I think you have to get burned a few times to kind of get on track. <laughs> yeah. I definitely, I mentioned like once when we launched, we didn't launch with plus size. So I definitely would have launched with that. But um, yeah, that's pretty much the only thing that I would have changed. I think that, you know, the growth process and the journey and everything has been interesting. Um, we've learned a lot along the way, but I wouldn't, really necessarily change anything okay all right okay so now let's jump into that lightning round you guys um you just answer the very first thing that comes to mind are you ready yep <laughs> all right <laughs> let's do this number one what is a resource that has helped you in your side hustle that you can share with the side hustle pro audience um we absolutely love shopify it's very easy to use it's intuitive um, and then they also offer seller financing, which is great. So Shopify. <laughs> okay. Uh, and by seller financing, do you mean for um, inventory? Uh, yeah. Or, they, they will let okay. you use it. Um, we use it specifically for inventory, yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Didn't know that. Alrighty. Number two, what has been the best business book or podcast or video series, anything that you've consumed this year? Um, I'm a big audiobook person. Um, my favorite this year was Blitz Scaling by Reed Hoffman. Blitz Scaling. Okay. All right. Number three, what is a non negotiable part of your daily routine? Um, I would say a non negotiable part of my daily routine is my me time, even if it's just for 20 minutes, um, taking the time to relax and gather my thoughts. I've realized that, you know, sometimes I get burned out and Taking that time to relax actually keeps me more productive and focused. Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly when you were side hustling? I would say focusing on the process rather than the outcome. Um, this definitely Ooh. keeps me from becoming overwhelmed and once again, like burned out. That is a word I needed, Vera. Thank you. <laughs> Let me stop. Lightning round. Okay. Number five, what is your parting advice for fellow Black women side hustlers who want to be their own boss, want to start something, but are stuck in their own head? Um, I would say most of the work that you're going to do up front is going to cost you very, I won't say little time, but you know, it doesn't have to cost you too much time or money. Um, you can do your research, you can find the right products, and you can set up your website all before you even you know, begin to work on your venture full time. Um, and when, like I said earlier, when the time comes to fully commit, I think you'll just go and then you should just go for it. I like that a lot. And it's a good, good reminder. Like you can do a lot of this stuff. The time you spend in your head thinking, freaking out, <laughs> there are actually a lot of small steps you can take to pace yourself and, and not be so overwhelmed. So thank you for those two awesome reminders. And Vera, where can people connect with you and love Vera after this episode? Because I know they're all coming to the website. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so our website is lovevera.com and our Instagram page is at shop love Vera. Our Twitter is at shop love Vera. All right. You guys head over to the website. Um, you're, if you're not already up on it, thank me later, just in time for the holidays. You're really going to love this. So thank you so much for being in the guest chair, Vera. This was amazing. Um, I, I really learned a lot for, you know, my secret business that I'm, I'm in the process of researching right now. <laughs> And y'all will hear more about later. Um, so thank you. And there you have it, you guys. Thank you so much for having me. 
Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six bullet Saturday newsletter at sidehustleproco slash newsletter. When you sign up, you will receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week. Again, that's sidehustleproco slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon. Thank you.